my name is Noelle Verley, and I'm the director of Metamorphoses by Mary Zimmerman, presented by the Bronx Science Theatre Department. I am so excited that you are able to join us tonight, and so excited that you get to experience this cultivation of many, many months of work. We started work on Metamorphoses back in August of last year, and the thing that has pushed every member of our team through all of these months really is that core theme of metamorphoses, which is change and how we recognize and adapt with that change, which was so vital, especially during this year. We took a production that usually takes place on a stage and brought it into each of our homes, sent green screens across New York City, and it wouldn't have been possible without every member of our cast and our crew, our production manager, Sylvie Klingborg, our assistant director, Grace Lim, our theater director, Miss Steiker. It was really such a combined effort of unity and I am so grateful to every single member of our team who was able to recognize that we needed to change and we just went with every experiment and possibility and idea and tried everything out and it has cultivated it into something that I am so proud of and am so excited for you to see. So without further ado, please enjoy Metamorphoses by Mary Zimmerman. Bodies I have in mind and how they can change to assume new shapes. I ask the help of the gods, who know the trick, change me, and let me glimpse the secret, and speak better than I know how, of the world's birthing and the creation of all things, from the first to the very latest. Before there was water and dry land, or even heaven and earth. Nature was all the same. What do we call chaos? With neither sun to shed its light, nor moon to wax and wane, nor earth hung in its atmosphere of air. If there was land and sea, there was no discernible shoreline. No way to walk on the one, nor swim or sail on the other. There was neither reason nor order until at last a god sparked, glowed, and shone like a beam of light to define heaven and earth and separate water from hard ground. Once these distinctions were made and matter began to behave, the sky displayed its array of stars in their constellations, a twinkling template of order, and the, the sea upon which they shone quickened with fish and the woods and meadows with game, and the air with twittering birds, each order of creature settling into itself. A, a paradise, it would seem. Except one thing was lacking. Words. And so, man was born. He was born so that he might talk. Some say that God perfected the world, creating of his divine image the race of humans. Others maintain that we come from the natural order of things. But one way or another, people came, erect, standing tall with our faces, set not to gaze down at the dirt beneath our feet, but upwards towards the sky in pride or perhaps Nostalgia. What would you do with all the money in the world? What a question. I know what I'd do. Do you want to know what I'd do? No. I'd never do laundry again. That's it? That's the big dream? Among other things. Do you want to hear a little story? About rich people? Yes. Always. There was a certain king named Midas, net worth 100 billion. 
Now, I'm not a greedy man, <laughs> but it is an accepted fact, a proven fact, that money is a good thing. A thing to be longed for. A necessary thing. <laughs> and my god, I have a lot of it. It wasn't always this way with me. Uh, the boats, the houses by the sea, the summer cottages and the winter palaces, the exotic furnishings, the soft clothes, the food, and... Honey, can you stop that now? Be still now, Daddy's talking. Excuse me. <laughs> the outrageous food and 200-year-old wine. <laughs> no, it wasn't always like this. I came up from poor and I worked hard all my life. I still do, mind you. My father was a minor manufacturer and somewhere and somewhere. <laughs> but I was born with a head for business. And it's always been as though everything I touched has turned to gold. <laughs> Not literally, of course. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> it turned to profit, I meant. And, sweetheart, daddy asked you, be still. Take it inside. You see this pool? It costs a pretty penny, I can tell you. But all it takes is hard work, plain and simple. And those who haven't got it in them, well, what can anyone do? They just haven't got it. Be still! You're driving me nuts already! But you know, I never forget that I do it all for my... Uh, let's see, all for my... It's all for the... Uh, for the... Um, the family. Yes, that's what it's all for. Family is the most important thing, isn't it? One's own family, I mean. Not anyone else's, for God's sake. <laughs> when I get home, at midnight, seven days a week, <laughs> in the moments before sleep, I realize that... Um... I realize... Uh, what was I? Oh yes, that the family is what really matters. <laughs> Sir? Yes, what is it? This man's been making trouble in the town. We believe he's a vagrant, sir, of the worst, most drunken kind. Hello, King. What should we do? Nice place. Execute him? Uh, no need, no need. In my day, I've certainly been three sheets to the wind. Three sheets to the... What? What the hell are you talking about, King? I'm all... Rum down. Why, even last week at the feast for... Let me tell you something. You know what? No, what? Let me tell you. Yes? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Yes, all right. <laughs> I've been all over the world. Oh, have you? Yes. I'm lost now. But I've been all over the place. Mmm, how nice for you. You listening? Well, let me tell you, there's a country beyond this one where... Uh... How very fascinating. <laughs> well, if you will excuse me. No, listen. I strayed from the crowd. And I'm lost now. But there's a country. Asia? Further. Africa? No. Further. Over the ocean. I've been there. Oh? King, I tell ya, it's like a dream. A dream. I am telling you that in this place, the people, they see each other. And in this place, they live without desire of any kind and so time. There is no time. Just the blue sky above. And they got the pretty moon at night. And the meadow under their feet with the yellow flowers. And... Well, this has been most entertaining, but... And the people live forever. What? They live forever. They never die. What is it? Some herb they have? Some... Oh, no, 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 no. 
something in the air, something we could distill. I have shipping fleets, you know, to bring it. No, no, it's... Yes? Is that your daughter? What? Yes. Go on, get out of here! Be still for once in your life! Go on, go on. You are rich indeed. Go on. Is it an animal? Even better if it's an animal, we can breed them here by God millions. Don't worry, young man, you'll get your cut. No. Nope. No. It's not an animal? What is it? What is this secret to eternal life? It's here. Some formula? You have it, the formula? No, no. It's here. What? And here. Oh, that? The inner life? What uselessness. All right, then. Off you go. You may sleep in the cabana. Thank you. For God's sake, someone turn him over. Someone turn him over before he drowns. Night fell, but when the rosy finger dawn came again. Midas? Good lord, who's there? It's Bacchus. I hear you have a follower of mine. A follower? Yes, uh, Silenus. He wandered from our group as we passed close to town, and I hear he is with you. Uh, the fellow of the cabana. <laughs> yes, take him, he's all yours. <laughs> I'm grateful that you didn't turn him away, Midas. That you took care of him and saw that he didn't drown in his condition. And I'd like to present you the gift. A gift? Some ability, a minor miracle, something to do at parties. Anything? Anything at all. You promise? <laughs> Yes, of course. Then, grant me that everything I touch, everything I put my hand to, will turn to solid gold. That's a really, really bad idea. What do you mean it's a bad idea? It's a brilliant idea. Think about it, Midas. No, you think about it. You gave your oath. We had a deal, for God's sake. Now follow through. All right, then. And from that moment on, everything he touched turned to solid gold. Wait a minute, wait a minute, let me think where to begin. He went out walking, and with every step, the gravel under his feet turned to golden nuggets. Delighted, he put his hands to branches of trees and flowers and had golden branches and flowers. All day long he experimented, almost insane with happiness, that the whole of the world could become his personal treasure. Late at night, he stumbled back into the courtyard, laden with precious gold. No! Take it away! Bacchus! Take it away! I can't. Yes! You can! You must! Take it away now! I'm sorry. No! Take it away now! There is one way, Midas. What? What is it? Walk as far as the end of the earth. Look for a pool of water that reflects the stars at night. Wash your hands in it, and there is a chance that everything will be restored. Was that too sad for you? A little. All right then, here's another. There once was a king named Teex who had as his queen, all seeing a daughter of Aeolus, master of the winds. These two adored each other and lived in a monotony of happiness, but nothing in this world is safe. It isn't true. It is. One day, Alcini had heard that Teex had ordered his ship to be made ready for a sea voyage to visit a far-off oracle. How could you leave me alone? I'll pine in your absence. Overland, it's a long and arduous trip, but I'd still prefer that to a voyage by sea, which I fear, for my father's winds are wild and savage. I mean, you think as his son-in-law you may get some special treatment? Not so. 
Once they've escaped my father's cave, those winds are wild and beyond anyone's control. As a girl, I watched them come home, exhausted and spent, and I learned to fear them then. Now I am petrified. I mean, surely, she said, if you die, my life is over, and I shall be cursed with every reluctant breath I draw. My love, I hate to choose between my journey and you, but how can I live this way? Stranded on shore, afraid, domesticated, diminished? A kind of lapdog? Take me with you, at least, and we'll meet the storms together, which I fear much less than to be left a widow. In two months' time, I'll be back. No, I fear you won't. I know you won't. In two months' time, for that short time, you can be brave and endure the trial of waiting. She was hardly consoled, but she saw she could not hold out any longer in the face of his resolve. She allowed herself to be soothed and consented to his going. There were no more details left to be checked, no last-minute changes to make, and the men, arranged on their benches, were ready to row and go. He boarded and gave the sign, and then he turned to wave at her. She waved at him while the ribbon of black water widened between the ship and the shore. She gazed at him until he was no longer distinguishable, but still she could see the ship. And she narrowed her eyes to the horizon and watched it as it receded to a smaller and smaller object. And then the whole hull was gone and only the sails remained and then they too disappeared. She gazed still at the empty and desolate blue and then went back to her empty bedroom to lie in the huge and vacant bed and give herself over to weeping. The vessel cleared the harbor and caught the freshening wind which set the rigging to singing and slapping against the spars. I ordered the rowers to ship their oars, and the sailors set the yard to make sail. The ship ran before the wind. We made satisfactory progress all that day, and it reached a point of no return, with as much blue water astern as remained ahead. But as the sun was sinking in the west, the water everywhere blue until now began to be flecked with the white-capped waves that sailors disliked. The weather was worse with every moment, for the winds were on the loose. Reef the sails! Bail the water! Secure the spars! But Poseidon and his henchmen had arrived. The rest was one enormous green catastrophe. He thinks in an oddly abstracted way that the waves are lions crazed with plunger's wounds, or that the ship is a besieged town attacked by a horde of madmen. One would think that the heavens were crazed with lust, to join the turbulent sea, which would turn the bizarre passion and try to rise up and embrace the air. The men have lost their belief in the captain, their courage, their nautical skill, and even their words of love as they have for them. One weeps and groans aloud. Another will go over the silent, dumbstruck. One calls upon the gods for mercy, and another will persist his fate and one says one word. I'll see any. Again and again. I'll see any my treasure out. And this is the end of the world. Oh gods, hear my modest prayer, that my body wave wash ashore at her feet, where she may with gentle hands prepare to be buried. Nothing left but the slow parade led by Hermes to the underworld. One, two, three, four, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, ninety-eight. Ninety-nine, one hundred. One, two, three, four, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred. Look at her iris. She's moved her vigil down to the shore, and now she's sleeping there. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred. Seeks, come home. I'm nearer now. I'm sleeping on the shore. It isn't so far until you see me. This can't go on forever. Go to the House of Sleep and ask him to arrange a nighttime visitation, a dream that might show our Alcini the sorry truth. Far off in remotest Campania, beyond where the Cimmerians live in their gloomy caves, is a deeper and even deeper grotto, the home of sleep. In this place, the sun never can, even at midday, penetrate with the faintest beams. In that cloudy twilight, no rooster dares disturb the silence with his rude crowing. No dog or goose gives voice to challenge the passing stranger, but an almost total silence fills the air. 
at the heart of an almost painted stillness, the god himself relaxes, drifting in languor. Around him, fra the fragments of ill-assorted dreams hover over the floor in grand profusion like tree leaves the trees have let go to float in their gorgeous billows below. Hello? Into this strange and breathless place, Iris the rainbow intrudes. So, oh, Sanlun one, Sanlun one, wake up. What? Smileless of all the gods, soother of souls, and healer of wearied and pain racked bodies and minds. Iris, let me rest a moment. Iris, what do you want? Devise, if you can, a form to resemble the king seeks, and send it down in a dream to his wife, the queen Alcyone. Let her know the news of the wreck of his ship and the death of the husband she loves so well. Um, sleep. Do this for us, can you? Farewell! Morpheus, Morpheus, come and change your shape to that of King Seeks. Go to his wife and tell her. Tell her he's dead. That's good. That's very good. Now go. Sir? You seem like a sea-fearing man. Can you tell me where is my husband Seeks? Have you seen him on the sea? His ship is strong and unmistakable. When is he coming home? Have you seen him? Sir? Do you not know me? Has death undone me so? No! Look at me. I charge you, look at me! No, I won't, I won't! Look at me. And know you're a husband's ghost. Your prayers have done no good, for I am gone. Beyond all help or hope forever. Go away! I am not some bearer of tales, but the man himself to whom it happened. Look at me, my little bird. I told you! I knew it would happen and I begged you not to go! I knew that the day you had sailed, I had lost you forever! The ship, my hopes, and my life grew smaller all at the same time! You should have allowed me to come. Little bird! This is no good. No good that I should be living and you be elsewhere or nowhere. I am drowning now in the air. I am wrecked here on the shore where the currents are just as cold and cruel. Get up from your bed and put on your morning clothes. Wait. Wait, where are you going? Come back. Wait for me and I'll go with you as wives are supposed to go with their husbands. Lucina! Lucina! Give me your lantern! Seeks! Come back! Where are you? Come back! He was here! Where is he? Where is he? All that night, she searched along the shore for her drowned, dreamed husband. But she found nothing. Not even footprints. Just wave after wave of black water. When morning came, she narrowed her eyes to the horizon and remembered how she had looked on that other day. She remembered his last kiss, the way he turned to the ship, couldn't bear it and turned back to her. What is that out there? Oh, it is a man. Alas, poor sailor for your wife and... The gods are not altogether unkind. Some prayers are answered. Seeks, is this how you return to me? She began to run to him, but as she ran crying, a strange thing happened. By the time she reached him, she was a bird. She tried to kiss him with her bill and by some trick of the ocean's heaving, it seemed as though his head reached up to hers in response. You ask, how could he have felt her kiss? But better ask, how could the gods not have felt this, seen this and not had compassion? For the dead body was changing. 
restored to life and renewed as another seabird. Together they still fly, just over the water's surface, and mate and rear their young, and for seven days each winter, Alcyone broods in her nest, which floats in the gentled waters for Aeolus, her father, and keeps the winds short-reined, and every year gives seven days of calm upon the ocean. These days we call the Halcyon days. You've heard of Orpheus, the greatest musician of all time, and his bride, Eurydice. His was the unluckiest of wedding days. <gasps> Orpheus and Eurydice, number one, Ovid, 88. Orpheus, the widower bridegroom, mourned her in the upper world, but his grief was limitless. Inconsolable, desperate, he left the warmth and sweetness of our air. He dared to descend the Rustix and crossed it to the underworld. Through that dim domain, all shimmering, buried ghosts, he passed until he arrived at his melancholy heart, where he found his king lying with Persephone. He knelt before them, drowning in his grief. I don't know what power love has down here, but I've heard that he is some, for he brought you two together. If that's true, that passion has moved you once, then listen to me. I've tried to master this grief, and I can't. I understand we all come here in the end, but my bride Eurydice will soon enough be your citizen in the ripeness of her years. I'm asking for a loan, not a gift. If you deny me, one thing is certain. I want you to keep me here as well. As Orpheus spoke, the pale phantoms began to weep. Tantalus was no longer thirsty, and Sisyphus sat in his rock to listen. Orpheus, turn around. Eurydice. Your song has moved us, Orpheus, and you may have her on one condition. As you ascend and leave this place, she will not walk beside you, but she will be following. You must not, until you pass our gates, turn around to look at her. If you look at her before you reach the sunlight, she is ours, forever. I understand. Hermes will accompany you. Remember, hesitation or doubt, and our gift must be returned. A simple enough condition? It ought to have been. The singer led the way, ascending the sloping path through the murk. A long way they traveled, almost all the way, but you know what happened. Concerned for her, not quite believing that it wasn't a cruel delusion, a dream, or a mirage. He turned. Farewell! That was his last sight of her, but he saw it again and again. Farewell! Is this story a story of love and how it always goes away? Farewell! Is this story the story of how time can move only in one direction? Farewell! Is this story the story of an artist and the loss that comes from sudden self-consciousness or impatience? Farewell! Orpheus and Eurydice, number two. Rainer Maria Rilke, 80, 1908. He said to himself, they had to be behind him, said it aloud and heard it fade away. They had to be behind him, but their steps were so ominously soft. If only he could turn around just once. But looking back would ruin this entire work so near completion. But then he could not fail to see them, those other two who followed him so softly. The god of speed and distant messages. A golden crown above his shining eyes, his slender staff held out in front of him, little wings fluttering at his ankles, and on his arm, barely touching. She. A woman so loved that from one lyre came more lament than from all lamenting women, that a whole world of lament arose in which all nature reappeared, forest and valley, road and village, field and stream and animal, and that around this lament world, even as around the other earth, a sun revolved and a silent star-filled heaven, a lament heaven with its own disfigured stars, so greatly was she loved. Now she walked behind the graceful god, her steps constricted by the trailing grave clothes. Uncertain, gentle, and without impatience. She was deep within herself, like a woman heavy with child, and could not see the man in front or the path ascending steeply into light. Deep within herself. Being dead filled her beyond fulfillment, like a fruit suffused with its own mystery and sweetness. She was filled with her vast death, which 
was so new she could not yet understand that it had happened. She had come into a new virginity and was untouchable. Her sex had closed like a young flower at nightfall, and her hand had grown so unused to things that even the gods' infinitely gentle touch of guidance hurt her, like an undesired kiss. She was no longer that woman with brown eyes who had once echoed through the poet's songs. No longer the wide couch of Sentinel Island and that man's property, no longer. She was already loosened like long hair, poured out like fallen rain, shared like a limitless supply. And when abruptly the god put out his hand to stop her, saying with sorrow in his voice, He has turned around. She could not understand and softly answered, dark beyond the shining exit gates someone or other stood whose features were unrecognizable he stood and saw how on this strip of road among the meadow with a mournful look the god of distant messages silently turns to follow the small figure already walking back along the path her steps constricted by the trailing grave clothes uncertain gentle without impatience. There once lived a wood nymph named Pomona, whose skill in the care of trees and plants has never been equaled. She hardly noticed the rivers and forests, but she loved the fields and orchards. These were her passion and her life. And she didn't disdain Aphrodite so much as ignore her. She kept aloof from any suitor. There was, however, one suitor. The god of springtime, Vertumnus. He was in love with her more than all the rest. He adored her. In the manner of the Shire gods, he used to disguise himself. He'd put on a straw hat and a working man's shirt and stick hay stalks behind his ears to look like some storybook yokel. Howdy! And that produced nothing. He thought he might hold in his hand a pruner to seem as though he were a field hand who tends the grapes in their arbors. After the complete failure of that, he came with a ladder to seem as though he were bound for some nearby orchard to gather apples. With wigs, costume, and makeup, he once took himself out to be a soldier, romantically returned from foreign wars. Another time, he set himself up as an ordinary fisherman, fishing in her path and the chance that she might pass him by. He waited from dawn to dusk, passing from boredom to terror and back again. The point was just to be near her. Stand there and gaze at her beauty. Maybe to wish her good morning. Or. Good afternoon. Or. Good evening. Before he plodded on by. I live for these trivial moments. One day, he put on an old woman's dress and a wig, and he wandered through the green, green hills until he saw his beloved standing in the lavender. Lovely. Truly lovely. But you miss a lovelier still. Look at that, would you? And think how that tree and vine complement each other, complete each other. They're separate, they aren't much, but together, they're splendid. There's a lesson in that, my dear, one that you might consider. The way you've been keeping to yourself is no good. Oh, it's a sad violation of nature, as well as a waste. A lover is what you need to make you complete as a woman. You'd have many choices, I think, as many as Helen. But there is one in particular I'd recommend. Vertumnus. Ah, I know him as well as I know myself, and I warrant, oh, I guarantee, that his eyes are for you alone. Consider he's young, attractive, healthy and strong. Your tastes, too, are the same, for he likes trees and gardens almost as much as you. Besides, he's fun and takes on various disguises. <laughs> it's a game he likes to play. Oh, believe me, you may take these words that I speak as if they were coming from his own mouth.
None of this was working. Listen, aren't you afraid of offending Aphrodite? No, and why are you wearing that ridiculous wig? I don't know. I thought... Take it off, and take off that idiotic dress. I'm embarrassed. Just take it off. When at last the god revealed himself just as he was. Much to his surprise, he had no need for words. Little Pomona was happy with what she saw, unadorned and undisguised. Soon enough, the vine was clinging to the tree. Go on. Well... My father left when I was really young. Before I was even born, it was sort of a one-night sort of thing. Except it was in the day, in a meadow, where my mother went to watch my father pass by every day. And I always knew who he was, of course. Who doesn't? But he was never really around. I mean, not around, around. Where better might we find a more precise illustration of the dangers of premature initiation than this ancient tale of alternating parental indulgence and neglect. So I went to an expensive school. There were a lot of boys that were, you know, sons of the rich and famous. And one day, this kid, after this, goes up to me, so fame, blah, 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 who's your father? What does he do? Blah, blah, blah. So I tell him, my father's a son. And he says, tell me another. And I say, he's the son. He's Phoebus Paul. And then he just basically trims me, beats the shit out of me like I was lying. Neither his own opinion of himself, nor the regard for him or lack of it in his peers, obviates from the father's primitive role as initiating priest for the younger being. Now it cannot be contested that the absence of this figure is, for the son, an almost irredeemable loss. So anyway, I go home and I say, Mom, this happened, you know, at school. And she gets all upset, crying and everything, because she still loves him, and it's an insult to her as well. And I'm like, well, if it's true, how come there's no proof of it? It's unfair to us, you know? But there's no proof. And then she gets more upset and says, hear me, my child, in all his glory, your father looks down upon us. By his splendor, I swear, you are his truly begotten son, that fiery orb you see crossing the skies each day and night, that enlivens and enables our world, is indeed your sire. Believe me, my darling, blah, blah, blah. When he matures beyond the customary Eden of the mother breath, the child seeks to individuate himself beyond its enfolding gates, and turns to the new symbols of the paternal realm thus beginning his spiritual passage from one sphere to the next. So she tells me to go to the valley where she met my father and just ask him to set me straight, you know, do right by me. So anyway, I sit out and it's hot, and it's dusty, and it's a long way across Ethiopia, and like part of the time I hitch and part of the time I walk, and finally, finally when I get there, the hill is steep. But this passage is never easy. At the door, my dad's secretaries, the days, the hours, the centuries, they recognize me. They say, go on in. So there he is, all shining and golden. I, I, I can't even look at him, he's so bright. And, and, and you know what he says to me? He says, my son, you are welcome. My son, you are welcome. Speak, Phaeton, to your father. Speak, Phaeton, to your father. I cannot tell you how much this was to me, so I, I just tell him everything, you know, I spill my guts. So he listens to me, and he says, let me grant you a favor. Let me grant you a favor. Whatever you ask for shall be yours. Whatever you ask shall be yours. And, and he swears to it. The conventional exordium of the initiates from latent to realized potential is inevitably accompanied by a radical realignment of his emotional relationship with the Omega, the parental authority. Now, there's only one thing I want. I mean, it's obvious, right? I say, give me the keys to your car. Immediately, he starts backpedaling, saying, oh, it's his job. 
It's my job. And no one else can do it. You can't do it. And then up in the sky, there are the bull and the lion and the scorpion. There's a scorpion. To get me, and I say, give me the keys to your car. I want to drive it myself. You promise. It's my turn. I want to like the world today. The father or his substitute must be assured before he transfers the symbol of adult location that the son is no longer operating from infantile complexes, uh, complexes that might dangerously redirect his new task through the unconscious promptings of self-aggrandizement, personal preference, or even resentment. So, he finally hands over the keys, but he won't stop giving advice, you know, like, don't fly too high. Don't fly too high. Nor too low. Stay in the tracks. Go slant-wise. Go slant-wise. On and on. But I didn't listen. Myths are the earliest forms of science. It was chaos, okay? Out of control, as if no one were driving. My knees were weak, I was blind from the light. I set the earth on fire, and I fell. And that just destroyed me. You know, it completely and utterly destroyed me. O-V-E-R. Over. It has been said that... It has been said that the myth is a public dream. Dreams are private myths. Unfortunately, we give our mythic side scant attention these days. As a result, a great deal escapes us, and we no longer understand our own actions. Therefore, it remains important and salutary to speak not only of the rational and the easily understood, but also of enigmatic things. The irrational and the ambiguous speak both privately and publicly. Who's this? This is Eros, the god of love. Why does he have wings? So he can move quickly from body to body. Why is he naked? To make us transparent. To make us what? Transparent in our love, foolish to others, exposed. Why is he blind? He's always pictured blind, but he really isn't. Because in love, we are so ignorant and so compulsive. <laughs> There's that. What else? He is wanting to show how he takes away our ordinary vision, our mistaken vision, that depends on the appearance of things. Who's this coming down the stairs? Her name's Psyche. Psyche? Her name's Psyche? Yes. And what's she doing here? She's married to the god, but she's never seen him. Why is that? He forbids it. How did they meet? Psyche was so beautiful. The lives of Aphrodite hated her. She sent her something to punish her, but he fell in love instead. Does she know that he's a god? <laughs> no. She suspects he's a monster. Have they had sex yet? Oh, yes. And how was it? It was good. Then why does she suspect he's a monster? Her jealous sister told her so. And she listened to them? Unfortunately, yes. So now she's coming to see him as he sleeps? Yes. To make certain? Yes. With her eyes? Yes, she's very young. It happens all the time. She doesn't trust what she's felt herself? Not with the radical trust we need. What does the word psyche mean? In Greek, it means the soul. What's going to happen to her now? She's going to suffer. And? She's going to suffer. And? She's going to suffer. What does she have to do? She's been given horrible and lonely tasks by Aphrodite. Such as? Sorting thousands of little seeds, one from the other. How did she manage? Some little insects helper. Like in fairy tales! Like in all the fairy tales. What else? She had to go down to the underworld, fetch, um, various things. Wasn't she afraid? She was petrified, but she did it all the same. Wasn't it hopeless? It was, 
hopeless. But she did it all the same. What did love do in the meantime? He healed his little wound. It hurt him so much when she looked at him like that. The wax from the candle fell on him and burnt him. How does it end? Well, she finishes all her tasks and Zeus declares enough is enough. He overrides Love's mother. Yes. And further, he gives Psyche a special potion and she becomes immortal. He then declares that their love will last forever. Does it? Of course. So it has a happy ending. It has a very happy ending. Almost none of these stories have completely happy endings. This one's different. Why is that? It's just inevitable. Our soul wanders in the dark until it finds love, and so wherever our love goes, there we find our soul. It always happens? If we're lucky. And if we let ourselves be blind. Instead of watching out. Instead of always watching out. Now, if you will indulge us, we have one more tale to tell. A coda, if you will. It happened that one night, Zeus, the lord of the heavens, and his son, Hermes, went down to the mortal realm to see what the humans are really like. They disguised themselves as two old beggars, ragged and filthy, stinking and poor. They knocked on a thousand doors. Hello. Do you have any spare- Get out of here! Get the hell out of here! I work hard for my money. And the thousand doors were slammed on them. Hello! We're tired, we live on the street, and we were hoping you might- I'm sorry. I'm, uh, so sorry. Sorry. At last, they came to a little hut on the outskirts of town. Why bother knocking here? We've been to houses of all kinds, the homes of people with plenty to spare. Whoever lives here obviously has nothing. Let's give it a try all the same. We've come all this way. <coughs> this is pointless. Let's just go home. Poor strangers! Philemon, there are guests at our door! Hello. We are strangers to these parts, and we've lost our way, and- Vasus, why are you standing there? We must bring our guests inside. Do you know us? Of course. You do? Yes. Then who are we? Why, you are children of God. Come in, come in. The two immortals, satisfied that their disguises had not been seen through, entered the house, lowering their heads to fit through the door. No, don't sit on the floor. Sit on chairs, as quality people do. Philemon ran to get another chair. And Bousies fetched two pieces of cloth to pad them so that the strangers might rest easy. She stirred the coals in the hearth and fanned the fire to cook them a meal. Philemon set out the embroidered cloth that they had saved for feast days. Bousy saw that one of the legs of the chair was short. So she popped it up with a shard of pot. Philemon set out a plate of olives, green ones and black, and a saucer of cherry plums. Then there was cabbage and some roasted eggs. And for dessert, there were nuts, figs, dates, and plums. And a basket of ripe apples. Remember how apples smell? At last, with a show of modest pride, they brought out a bit of honeycomb for sweetness. Philemon poured wine from a bottle, but as he filled the glasses with the guests, he saw that the bottle remained full. And then they knew. Oh, mercy! Mercy! You are divine, and we've served you such a simple meal. Belsis, go and kill the goose! Let it live. We are gods, and we thank you. You've done enough. More than your nasty neighbors thought to do. Suddenly, everything was changing. Their poor little house, their simple cottage, was becoming grander and grander, a glittering marble column temple. The straw and reeds of the thatch roof metamorphosed into gold, and gates with elaborate carvings sprang up as ground gave way to marble paving stone. Old man, old woman, ask of us what you will. We shall grant whatever request you make of us. Having spent all our lives together, we ask that you allow us to die at the same moment. I hate to see my wife's grave or have her weep at mine. The gods granted their wish. Arrived at a very old age together, the two sat at what had been their modest doorway and now was a grandiose facade.
and Baucis noticed her husband was beginning to put forth leaves, and he saw that she too was producing leaves and bark. They were turning into trees. They stood there, held each other, and called, before the bark closed over their mouths. Farewell. Farewell. Walking down the street at night when you're all alone, you can still hear, stirring in the intermingled branches of the trees above, the ardent prayer of Baucis and Philemon. They whisper. Let me die the moment my love dies. They whisper. Let me not outlive my own capacity to love. They whisper. Let me die still loving, and so never die.